welcome to the delicious recap. Um, we are here with you today. I am, uh, you know what? I didn't have a character today. So I'm just going to be Andrew Shepard. Very formal. Damn. Not Andrew A.J. Vanderton? Why Andrew Shepard? Why are you using your well, government name? We'll just be very formal today because um, I saw something that I thoroughly enjoyed today that had to do with my government name. And that's just the fact that Andrew happens to be quite the star name when it comes to people testifying in court. Somebody oh. testified in court and their name was Andrew. Oh, my God. Is it too bad if I ask you to give me more details? I'm, I'm very curious as to what happened. I don't know any details about what happened. I just know that this person who I follow on TikTok happens to be named Andrew and he testified in court and put it on his TikTok today. Okay. And <laughs> so that makes you feel proud that there's an Andrew that is um, getting to be iconic in the court system or does it make you like slightly concerned that, oh man, am I next? It makes me jealous that I'm not a juror. I would love jury duty. Jury duty people, if you know my information, which you should because you're the government, pick me. I want to be on a jury. You see, that's where you and I differ and yet another example of how you should just be best friends with my wife, Tony, because she is dreaming of the day to be called for jury duty and I think I had an instance where I was called, but I was able to be excused from it. I just see it as an opportunity to sit very boringly and hear information that I'm barely going to pay attention to. I know it's paid for. I know the lunch is paid for, but um, I, I don't see it as like, oh, hey, like I get to be involved in the criminal case. I just see it as, oh my God, my time is going to be spent in a quiet courtroom or a quiet decision room as opposed to just being at home and watching TV. <laughs> That's what I see it as. This will probably ruin my chances of ever being a juror. I don't give two shits about the justice system. I don't care about rating the case. I don't care about that at all. I am off, paid, and get to relax while people talk to me. So I don't need anything right. else. You know what? All right, all right. I, I, so I'm going to... This might be the first time where I'm going to actually be someone uh, because I usually am not. I'm usually John Francois, my real self. Um, I think that I'm going to be Margie this week. I think that uh, the way that Margie was portrayed and the way that her personality um, became of benefit to the episode idea by the end of it, I thought, Yay, because Margie represents what we need in politics. We need substance. There is a lot of personality, a lot of um, oh, oh, sensationalism. And I think Margie represents somebody that we could use more of in our political system. So Margie from our episode 20 will be who I am this week. Okay, Marge, I see you out here. She had really good glasses too. Did she? Uh, weren't they like traditional 80s, 90s uh, big frame glasses? Yes, they were some good glasses. I want her glasses. They were good. I can see that because you have a similar big frame. I mean, yours is more on the serial killer side. I, I've always loved that. But yeah, no, I think that if you bring back the Marchie glasses, hopefully for one episode, maybe during a Halloween episode, I, I will be forever indebted to you. I might do that if I can find them and see out of them. I will do it. <laughs> I don't know. Shall I give the basic details of what, what we're recapping before we dive in? Yeah, let's hop into it because this episode, it had a lot. It had a lot of stuff in it. I am interested to hear what you thought about it because I think we're going to have some very differing takes when it comes to this Margie character and really? the presidential election. Really? I'm very curious. Yes. Oh my God. So we're recapping season one, episode 20, The Candidate. Uh, ep uh, original air date is March 23rd, 1990, written by Barry Gold. Finally, Rich Carell does not have a hand in this episode. This one is directed by James O'Keefe, although I think Rich directs the last two episodes of this season, so I'll hold my breath on that one. Our guest stars, of course, we have Julia White, Steve Urkel, uh, Randy Jocelyn, unfortunately, returns as Rodney Beckett. Um, Rachel Griffin is Margie Flatman. Ara Easley is Rebecca. Anel Edwards is Pam Mitchell. So I think Rebecca and Pam are the uh, debate moderators, if I had to guess. That's and, what I'm thinking. 
Yeah, and Dianca Brown, what a name, Dianca, D-E-O-N-C-A, she plays girl. <laughs> and I think uh, she is the girl that, uh, you know, screams for Eddie uh, during his uh, election debate moment. So there you go, Dianca Brown. You are girl. You're girl, and girl, you stole that moment. <laughs> she was who I was originally going to be, but I kept rewinding. I'm like, did they ever give this girl a name? And they did not. <laughs> so. Oh, my God. So uh, a very quick, the Hulu synopsis, Eddie runs for president uh, for his freshman class because he thinks it'll make him more popular with girls. A uh, very simple, straightforward, dumb Eddie-like storyline. And I mean, give it to me. I mean, look, we could we could do this how we did it last week where uh, you, you give me your way of recapping this and I'll give you mine. I, I, I want you to give me the full scope of how you think we're going to differ greatly in this episode. I'm going to give you my dose my like dose of information I have here and then I have to hear what you think because yeah. this episode was good. It was good. My first commentary on this episode. This episode I feel like was in the beginning of when Urkel started to like get bigger because Eddie's hair, he no longer has his part. It doesn't look good anymore. He's back to that very non-parted boxy haircut, which I mean was a style back then, but it just makes me question when this episode was filmed in the order of progression because it just seems like everybody's fashion kind of took a step back. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that I noticed in this episode. My big points here that I really did care about first are cold open. Urkel up there as the discus thrower, but supposedly supposed to be a Greek god, and I could not find what god throws a discus. Unless it's Zeus, but I don't know for sure. But that only drew me in because of my geeky school history and being an art history major in college. And that's the only reason why that hold open finally captured me. This is probably the first one with Urkel where I was more intrigued than bored. Hmm. Yeah, this it was the first time. Every other time I was like, okay, this is cool. But I was intrigued in it. And just because it gave me that little mental note to go back to art history. And then I found the sculpture that he's posing as that Eddie is trying to recreate. So I was like, okay, I think I found something really good. The sculpture, yeah. if you want to know it, it's called the Discobolus. It's by Myron. He's the sculptor who made it back in ancient Greece. And that sculpture, it's tiny, but it's known world round just for that discus thrower pose. Wow. So you, uh, you're you throwing all these names at me. Um, uh, I don't know what you said. Meniscus, uh, Boba. I, you're, throwing, you're throwing all these names. And I, uh, yeah, I mean, as someone who is not too familiar with uh, Greek mythology, other than like Zeus and Hades, like, yeah, I I, I, I really am fascinated by uh, your uh, your knowledge of that and, and how it uh, kind of influenced what you thought about the cold open. So... Yeah, no, I mean, once we get to it, I mean, I, I just had a more uh, simplified, un-Greek mythology nerd way of, of approaching it. And so, it, you know, it touched my nerd and I loved it. Um, nothing else in the cold opening was good. The rest of it was really bad to me. I just did not care <laughs> for it. Um, everything else, I was like, y'all don't need to talk. Nobody needs to say anything. Like, I could have just gone with just the pose and then boom, we get the opening. But my big things, and you know, I am not an order person here. I'm just going to go by what hit me the strongest as we started it Rachel's story we need to bring Rachel to the table and it's time to talk about therapy um <laughs> Yeah. Because it's getting yeah. out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> were, were you like me? Um, and, and of course, the story you're, you're referencing when uh, Rachel uh, is, uh, she, I, I, she it, she's trying to put together like what, a book report about the benefits of recycling? Like it seemed like she was in school and this was for like a community college class at night where she had to put up a book report. What, what was the whole gist of it? So she's in an ecology class and she's learning about about conservation and then she has to give a report about recycling so in the midst of her studying for her report she decides hey we've got to be earth friendly and conscious so i want to start recycling in the winslow household and i have to say i could have just gone for this as the episode really okay i would have argued that it would have been better to have 
Judy in that role of Rachel, because you on your point about the whole therapy thing, I do think that the way Rachel handled the whole recycling thing, there was a part of me that was like, okay, you seem to be too grown to handle it this way. I feel like you're grown enough where you know that uh, just having recycling pile up pile up, pile up in this house to the point where cans are just falling from the closet, falling from the pantry. Like, I I felt like she's grown enough to know that that was going to backfire. So I do think that she needs therapy because I do think that the behavior that we have seen from her this season, it does seem like she is very young 20s lost sort of trying to discover herself trying this thing trying that thing like okay one moment she's writing the other moment she's an expert at car repair one moment she's really fantastic at recycling she doesn't know what she's doing with her life so she's like all right let me ingest myself into carl's life and you know make this lemon cream tart thing of his a business for the house that backfires there's been so many examples of rachel trying things out not thinking them through and it backfiring badly where I'm going to advocate for for what you you said. I think it's about time that uh, someone needed to have a chat with her about uh, breathing, thinking things through like an adult should. See, now I am with you because I thought about this being a Judy episode. I thought about like, oh, Judy's at school. They learn about pollution for the first time. And she's like, oh my God, we have to recycle. Everybody in this house has to recycle. I would have loved this as a Judy episode if Judy would have been paired with Rachel and then Rachel tried to make a money scheme out of it and follow that trope. I would have loved it for this episode. I, how can I say this? I think that Rachel is grieving and we're not addressing the grief that she's feeling of losing her husband. Because she has been doing more and more every episode to try to fill her life and stay occupied, but never seems to go on a second date with anybody, is refusing to get set up, doesn't like leaving the house, but then when she does leave the house, it's only for one of these half-baked schemes that she's made up that goes all awry and she obsesses over things. And I'm like, hmm, something about this. It's just tapping into me right now. And I'm like, grief is what I'm sensing that she's expressing that none of the family members are addressing and nobody's done an intervention for yet. Yeah. I mean, I think the best in terms of intervention, um, it was the Rachel's first date episode, like toward the end when Mama Winslow was like, oh, hey, you're hesitant about going out with Alan because of the loss of your husband. And one would have hoped that that would have been enough for Rachel to just kind of see like, all right, like it's okay to honor my husband, except that he's gone and move on with this fantastic man. But no, like once the Alan episode is done, Rachel just takes a step back and it's complicated for me because I've enjoyed a lot of supporting and crazy comic foil moments that she's had. But um, I don't know. There was something about <laughs> this recycling story 20 episodes into this season, a 22 episode season where I just kind of thought, hmm, how much more of this can we take? How much <laughs> more? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that with Judy being the child that she is and being wondrous and experimental and 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 it has a little bit of sass that, that you can laugh at, I feel like she has all the trappings of someone who I would accept doing the recycling thing in this way, even if it made a mess in the house. It's like, oh, yeah, you're a little kid. You're figuring shit out. But <clears throat> Rachel, uh, you know. This woman has had a husband. Uh, she's had a kid. She's had her own life briefly independently before she moved back in. Uh, yeah, she she too grown for this. She too grown for this. And uh, time will time will tell if uh, she becomes more growing of a person. Time will tell. There is more that I'm going to talk about this in my rating because my rating has to do with Rachel's obsession and. There's more to it that I think we get a glimpse at in this episode, but it's left where nobody addresses it. And it's a little darker than I thought I meant to be with this episode. I got a little dark (laughs) and I was like, whoa, Andrew, these notes. It looks like I'm watching like a Tyler Perry movie. (laughs) 
can't wait to hear it. So how about our how about our A story? You know, where where Eddie is trying to get the girls and he's running for freshman class president with the help of Rodney and Laura. So this is also an interesting story. I do think that this could have been a separate episode on its own, but it has enough meat there where it still made sense for this episode. Um, one, it's relatable to me because I ran for student body president when I was in high school. Is that something you did? No, 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 no. I've, I've seen posters of other people doing it, but no, I've never had the confidence to say, yeah, I want to do this myself. The the best I had in terms of confidence back in high school was was acting as somebody else in, in theater productions. Uh, uh, well, in a way, you were still political. You put on a face for people. And that's what politics is. It's just putting on your face and doing absolutely nothing and sending everybody's money to other people. But that's politics in America. I did like that we did get some political jokes that as a kid I would have never caught on to. As an adult, I was very enthralled. Um, Laura shined for me throughout the A story. I didn't really care for her at the end when she they made her seem like so cutthroat on winning, but I did like her like presence in the story with Eddie actually doing something different outside of the spectrum. Rodney we could have done without. Um, and there yeah. was me. <laughs> Wait, and how many times have we said that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If this guy who plays Rodney ever listens, I it's not personal. It's not that I don't like you. It's just that this character, I don't see a reason for him being there. And we had a major continuity issue. I don't know if you picked up on it with the button and the misspelling of Eddie's name, even though the entire time before they get to that, Rodney has made a sign that has Eddie spelled on it correctly next to the bag of buttons. Oh, like, with you, uh, so are you talking about the scene where Rodney is, is making all the... Psst- signage she's like you know doing the marker stuff and the vote for eddie signs as you say they're there but somehow on the buttons it says vote for Edie. yes it says vote for Edie on the button and he makes it seem like oh my god i thought this is how you spelled eddie and i would have been convinced if it was the joke that he was like oh i forgot but they made him play it like he literally didn't realize how to spell the word eddie when he's writing on a sign filling in the colors of the letters e-d-d-i-e and i was like this that takes away from the joke. They should not have had that sign there and him coloring it or the writing on the sign should have been misspelled. That I didn't would have pick made up it- on that. Like, I didn't pick up on that. I thought like, because there was a moment where Rodney was like, oh God, you know, if, if I had put that extra D, that would have cost money. So it's interesting that you noted that. I didn't see that lack of continuity between the sign and the and and the buttons so that's that's interesting i i, I personally i laughed at the at the vote for ed thing i thought it was great <laughs> it was hilarious it was i laughed a couple of times in this episode a couple of times this episode got me everything else in that scene as far as them getting ready for the actual oh my god what is it the election the debate thing is what yeah, they were yeah, getting like for debate, yeah. um i was like okay that's all fun that's nice my favorite part within the a story of eddie becoming president of the school is him learning to be political when he goes and he talks to Carl and Harriet in the kitchen. I screamed, I screamed. Um, I did not write down line for line because it was just funny enough where I was not paying attention to write down my notes. But what I ended up catching is Eddie is a smooth talker and he is trying to convince Carl and Harriet to vote for him. He convinces Carl easily. Harriet, she has to be like buttered up and he made two references to the show 227, which I love. And that was my mom's show. She freaking loved it. And then she also referenced Give Me a Break, which I've never seen. So then I had to look up Give Me a Break and now I have to watch it. It looks like it's going to be a hilarious sitcom. Correction, Give Me a Break, not Give Me a Break. I think it's Give Me, G-I-M-M-E, not G I M E. If that even matters. If that even matters. That does. Like, give me a break. I'll take it. Give me a break of that Kit Kat bar. I just had to say that. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) But the fact that you referenced those two shows and now I have a new one to watch. And then on top of that, 227, which I already love. And then I couldn't stop thinking of Jack A. Harry and uh, Harriet now. Like, the two of them together. I'm like, okay, I can see where he's reaching for the hair and everything here. Yeah. Oh, Jack A. Well, I've never seen 227. I still want to see it because of Jack A. uh, Because I thought that she was just born out of sister sister but nope you know 227 is where not only she started but i think she won an emmy for the, her performance and i think she mm-hmm. like broke 
ground in terms of you know being one of the first if not the first black actress to win in that category um so yeah no i mean i, I jack a her charisma as lisa landry her sass her humor um i i had a friend back in middle school who had that exact lisa landry flavor so uh i I think that in the future, we should be open to the idea of recapping 227. I am definitely down because all of the fashion that Jack A. Harry wore in 227 has influenced what I like to wear in drag. So I would definitely like to do that. Really? Oh my God. Yes. Yes. I freaking love her fashion. My mom didn't know, but that's what turned me gay. Oh. The show 227. <laughs> wow. Jack A. and 227. That's what did it. <laughs> that's the formula. That is the gay agenda, people. 227. Look, I mean, there was an interview opportunity with Jack A that I passed up on because, I don't know, something was happening. But if that interview opportunity comes up again, we got to, you know, come on and and just have the three of us so you could say like, hey, thank you for helping me discover myself. Yes. Oh, I will. I will tell her. Like, just so you know, you have inspired all of this. Um, the other things that I had here are really just more of the jokes that really came into play when it came yeah. to the actual presidential election. The uh, more adult jokes of like, hey, you're just going to tell somebody that you have committee looking into that. And once they have the results back, then you'll give us an answer. And eerily, eerily, it reminds me of just seeing Donald Trump. And I'm just like, oh, my God, what is about to happen here? <laughs> but um, the funny thing, Laura reminded me more of Henry Kissinger in this episode. If you are familiar with Henry Kissinger, I yeah. think he was a political campaign manager in the beginning of his career. So uh, th there's actually, uh, and, and you know what? It's funny you say that because Rachel made a Henry Kiss Kissinger joke. Uh, I think it was in regards to like, oh, you know, uh, women throw their hands at politicians. How do you, how else do you explain Henry Kissinger having a girl? Um, and then I had to remind myself like, oh, fuck, is Henry Kissinger still alive? Because he was alive for a long time. He died last November at the age of 100 to my knowledge, he was known as Nixon's foreign policy guy. He was. That's, to my knowledge, what he was known as. And I think he had a big hand in uh, talking Nixon through the Watergate cover up. So uh, we can look into it if we need to for wrong. Another thing that came to mind, you know, speaking of Henry Kissinger was that I think even in, in, in the kids back in 1990, like tuning into Family Matters, it, you know, you'd have to know your politics to know some of these jokes like Dan Quayle. I'm like, oh my God, like what fucking kid even in 1990 is going to fucking know about Dan Quayle and how dumb he was as vice president under George H.W. Bush. Uh, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. What were you saying about Henry Kissinger? No, it's okay. I, I, Henry Kissinger is just like the weirdest person in existence. Well, he's gone now, but he's just weird. I mean, he reminded me of the penguin from uh, Batman. Mm -hmm. That's who I always see when I see Henry Kissinger. But it's funny that Laura was in the background kind of playing the strings of everything, but she is also done. So I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting to see. And then we did get a Kissinger joke, which I laughed at. So that was probably everything in that grouping of episode that I thoroughly enjoyed. You ready for my 45 hour recap? <laughs> <laughs> I am ready. Give it to us. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hope it won't be that long. But anyway, so going going to the cold open, of course, we, uh, yeah, we do have Urkel dressed up as a Greek god for the sculpture Eddie is making in the Wisnow kitchen. We already established that. And I like that, you know, Urkel, he's got his chucks. He's got his knee-high gym socks. He's got short shorts with three-letter words that I couldn't quite make out. I think they were like bow and yap and whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I think they were just random phrases because I could not tell what those words were supposed to be. Yeah, and they had like yellow splats behind them. So that was a, an interesting choice. Of course, Urkel has the, the suspenders. Uh, he has a shirt that has the number that I think Jaleel will be that year, 14. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think Jaleel will be 14 in November of 1990, November 27, 1990, a full year before I existed in the world. Yeah, and you were, at that point, you were like, what, like two years? old i would have been two years old at that point okay and uh and 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 i think you already mentioned it what's what's the name of that greek god plant thing that was on urkel's head uh oh what is that the the reef the reef is that what it's called the halo i'm gonna call it a leafy halo okay all right uh i, I called it a greek god plant crown so let's <laughs> 
<laughs> Let's go with that. Um, you know, my only note about this cold open, I found it to be very quick and odd. I wasn't sure what made Eddie think like, oh, Steve would be a perfect muse for this greed got sculpture thing. Because I, I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, do you think Eddie was intentionally doing it as a joke? Was he doing it uh, very genuinely because he's dumb, oblivious Eddie? Like, what were you thinking about that? I think that Eddie thought, and this is just me going on a limb here, that a smaller person would be easier to model with the clay that he had because he didn't have a lot of clay there. So I'm thinking that's the only reason why he chose Steve. Okay. All right. Then you have like, you know, Laura coming in eventually in the cold open. Urkel is um, asking Laura if this reminds her of anything. And she says it reminds her to pick up a chicken, um, which is okay. Whatever. It's, it's a very Laura like line mean as you would expect it. Um, also kind of random. I just thought like, wow, out of anything, Laura, you just thought like, oh yeah, chicken. And uh, well, do you think it was commentary like, oh, Urkel's a chicken. He's a, he's a wimp. He's a, he's a wuss. Like maybe that was what she was referring to. I thought she was referring to Urkel's shape, but I was thinking like a whole chicken. I'm like, a whole chicken's pretty meaty. So I don't know. Maybe it was the shape or what Urkel was wearing. Like, hey, you look like a cooked chicken with leaves on your head. Yeah, maybe? I have no idea. But uh, a very quick, st- just cold open that I didn't really have enough time to process because uh, it was just at the snap of a finger. And I don't know if you noticed, I think most of the scenes, all I kept writing at the end of it was like, whoa, okay, that scene went by really quickly. Did you did you pick up on that? Like, I, it seemed like I was just starting to write notes on a scene and then all of a sudden, like when I finished like the first note, oh, this scene's over. What the hell? What the hell? This is the first episode I had to rewind multiple times. I'm like, why is this flying so fast? Yeah, it's insane. So we get to scene one, Rodney and Eddie coming in with the, I thought uh, they were coming in with stiff acting uh, when Rodney was announcing to Carl, Harry and Rachel in the kitchen that Eddie is going to be running for freshman class president. I I felt like there wasn't enough like emphasis or, you know, you know, in, in that announcement. And Eddie, of course, owing to the fact that Rodney is a terrible friend, Eddie is just like, oh, wait, what? I'm, I'm running for class president, Rodney? I, I think I'd like to think about it. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Rodney is uh, not uh, talking things through as he should. And not reading the room, Rodney. You're not reading the room. You haven't even discussed this with Eddie. He did have that deer in the headlights look that I did love. Yeah. Oh, God, Eddie, with that adorable look. And another odd line, like, remember when Rodney, like, you know, is telling Eddie, like, oh, yeah, you have charisma. And Eddie is like, well, I use dandruff shampoo. (laughs) I was like... Okay. No, no, no. I mean, maybe I'm just this gullible guy that's taking things too like overthinky, but is there a connection between dandruff shampoo and charisma? Yes, there is a dandruff shampoo called charisma. <laughs> it exists. Oh, is it, wait, is it, is it still in production? I don't know, actually. Um, you know what? Let me pull it up on Google real quick. But there is a dandruff shampoo. I'm sorry, I probably muted myself. There was a dandruff shampoo that was used back in the early 80s and 90s. And I remember it being called Charisma because my mom had a bottle of it. Hmm. So that joke now makes sense for people who didn't know what Charisma was, like me. Of course, it's going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> Here you go. Charisma shampoo. Yeah. Boom. Oh, my God. They still make it. They just changed the branding. Oh, all right. Well, there you go. <laughs> and will this indeed give you charisma? Will you feel a spark? Will you be, will you feel a caffeination of personality? Like once you put this shampoo on your head? So I have to ask you before I answer that. Have you ever seen one of the like Selsun Blue or uh, Head and Shoulders? is dandruff yeah. commercials as a kid not the commercials but i know the brand so the commercials at least back when i was a kid it would always be a person who has like these massive chunks of dandruff on their black dress shirt or some black shirt and people see it so the entire like commercial they're like brushing their shoulders off of this dandruff i know it's disgusting john like it's gross but the people would come around with like charisma would be one of them head and shoulders self and blue sulfur eight those are the big ones where in the commercial all of a sudden somebody comes around and they give them this bottle of shampoo they wash their hair and then the next day they're like charismatic at work they're signing a business deal <laughs> they're getting a date like it used to be the weirdest commercials ever uh, look i mean i guess there is some logic to that like think about it if you just go many days without uh shampooing your hair dandruff builds up you're 
your hair gets all itchy and 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 flaky and stuff like that. You're kind of, you're constantly going like this, 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 this. Like I, I could understand being irritable and not being your usual self. If that makes you a whole brand new person that everybody wants to fuck just because you have a little bit of head and shoulders that you had applied overnight. I don't know. That's another question. But uh, yeah, that's I look. It's it's worth thinking about. Now, here here's what I want to get into. Like I, I always I am fascinated by the, the 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 racial thing behind what you get on your hair. So, questions for you: Do black people get dandruff? And B, if they do, is dandruff for black people and lice for white people? I just had the weirdest thought when you said that. So I'm laughing at myself. <laughs> <laughs> so dandruff is universal. Anybody can get dandruff. It's all about your scalp as your skin, you know, our skin sheds. The skin on your scalp, it sheds in bigger flakes. And if it's really dry, it can shed under your hair, but it doesn't come out until you actually agitate your hair. And that's what creates the flakes that end up on your shoulders. So everybody can get dandruff. Um, now, I'm going to make it very clear. I have never seen a black person in a dandruff shampoo commercial. I've never seen that. And as far as I know, and I probably am wrong, I myself have never met, knew, or heard of a black person getting lice. So are we the uh, special kind of people that don't need hair products, as the commercial indicates? <laughs> you still need hair products. Still take care of your hair. Okay. But okay. I just never heard of, and I'm, I, it has to have happened sometime, but I've never heard of myself personally, any person who is Black getting lice. I mean, I remember in school, they would do the lice checks, and none of the Black people were ever pulled out. Yeah, okay. Yeah, because I think in like cartoons, I would, I would always see white people get lice. So I thought, all right, as a Black person, maybe I will never get lice unless I have the Sean Hunter hair magically. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, when I was a kid, I felt like undoubtedly, like you could brush my hair and a full on blizzard will come out onto the floor because of, you know, because you're a fucking boy and you don't care about anything. So you could go weeks, maybe months without shampooing your hair. N nowadays, I mean, for me, it's like minimum once a week I, I shampoo my hair. And still, like, there's occasions where I feel a little bit of itchiness here and there, but it seems like it might be more of a scalp thing, maybe like an irritated scalp or a dry scalp. Like, that could happen, right? Yeah, that could happen. I mean, washing your hair once a week, you still want to moisturize your scalp. Even at the once a week mark, you're stripping all of that moisture and like that good oil off of your hair and scalp. So always moisturize it at least, you know, once to twice in a week since your hair is really low. But if you grow your hair out, you want to moisturize it a little bit more. Okay. All right. Well, I I, I love this hair chat that we have to have as this side. <laughs> Because uh, it's important, you know, because hair is is a theme in Family Matters. I mean, Eddie has great hair. Harriet, I think, has great hair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, and, and, I'm, and we're going to focus on Laura's hair at some point later on in the show. So it all it all it all comes together. It all comes together. It does. And Carl cuts his hair off, but he still maintains that scalp. He does. He does. And, you know, going back to that line uh, that Rachel uh, said to Eddie, you know, honey, there's just something about a man in charge. Women always throwing themselves at politicians. How else? can Henry Kissinger get a date? And I, I found that to be a wonderful line because I felt like it was like, you know, sexist stereotyping and an insult to Henry Kissinger's looks just like all at once. And um, then we, of course, very quickly in this scene, go from Eddie being hesitant to run for freshman class to just, oh, hey, you know what? Great way to get girls. Seemed like it happened at the snap of a finger. And I thought that in this scene, Carl and Harriet did not need to be there. I felt like they maybe said like a millisecond of something and then just kind of disappeared in the scene. I remember that. And I remember it for the fact that I didn't remember hearing them say much at all. Yeah. Anyway, so we go to scene two, Carl, Harry, and Laura and Judy in the kitchen. Laura and Judy in bright blue and pink winter sweaters. They're doing homework at the kitchen table. Oh my God, I love this. So Judy is reading her multiplication problems out loud. Laura is asking Judy if she can do that quietly. Judy takes a moment, looks at Laura, looks at her homework, and then says, no. And then I laughed, the audience laughed, it was just perfect comic timing. The best little sister reaction is story. Yeah, this is why she should have been the star in the recycling story. I can see, oh, 
my gosh. If she was researching the planet dying from po- pollution, that would have been amazing. That would have been great. But no, Judy's in the background in this episode unnecessarily. Um, and speaking of our B story, we have Rachel collecting empty soda cans as part of the report on recycling for the ecology thing. Um, and the way she approached it, like I initially thought, wow, she's making it seem like recycling is just a thing that popped up in 1990 as opposed to something that's been around since like the fourth century. It just seems very like new and wondrous to her. Like, oh my God, recycling, that's a thing. Most people didn't recycle then. Recycling wasn't like a major like household thing for people. But I mean, she did act like, again, like you said, like it was fresh bread for the first time. Yeah. Oh God. But you know what? Fresh bread, when you taste it for the first time, nothing else matters. I, you know what? It, that is true. The world <laughs> seemed brighter the first time I had a fresh piece of warm bread. Yeah, yeah. Before then, it was just cold old lady bread, and now it's just nice young people fresh bread. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. Anyway, Rachel is guilting Carl into spreading whipped cream on his pie because, you know, Carl is, you know, allegedly spreading some toxins in the air with this whipped cream bottle. Uh, So Rachel aggressively takes the whipped cream can away from Carl. And I love how she's like, she's walking away, talking to herself in judgment of Carl. Like, I don't know. She was just muttering something like, you know, oh, some people just don't understand. They just, you know, want to, you know, pollute the earth so they can have pie. Like, I remember how she like said, Pa at the end, <laughs> kind of like how Jackie would say it from 227. Yeah, some yes. people want to make pie. Some people want to eat pie just so they can pollute the earth. <laughs> this is my favorite joke in the entire episode. Yeah. I screamed when Rachel screams at Carl. <laughs> I lost it. I was like, this scene. I was seen in that moment. Yeah. Oh God, it was so great. Um, I also loved how like she walks away and she just like randomly leaves her recycling on the kitchen counter. Like she, she's, she's just so stuck in her whole, in her whole talking to herself judgment of Carl that she's like, Oh yeah, whatever. Empty soda cans. I don't care about those in this moment. Um, and then, and then we have another scene that just ends quickly. So we go to scene three, Rodney doing all the work on Eddie's freshman class president election sign while Eddie is just walking around impatiently. I, I kept yelling to the TV, help him out, Eddie, help him out. What's going on? And he was doing absolutely nothing. Now, when you saw him just walking back and forth, were you concerned that Eddie's not helping and everything's going to be messed up? Or you're just like, help this man out? I think that um, Eddie should just have consideration that, you know, he cannot be a star on his own, that there is help that is needed for him to be a star. So so, you know, stop walking around, stop getting in your whole like, oh, yeah, Rodney, what's going on? What's taking so long? We got to do this. Like, you know, if you want things to be done, then put a hand in and help out and they'll get done more quicker. See that you see what Eddie was doing, though. He was acting very presidential. He was doing what presidents do. Oh, yeah. Like walk around like a diva expecting things to be done just like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Rodney's vote for Eddie versus uh, Laura's win with Winslow. Uh, I look, I'm going to choose Laura. Laura's win with Winslow suggested line. It just rolls right off the tongue, you know, win, Winslow. Like, that's a great association. It really is. It works smoothly. And then Rodney is mistakenly printing uh, Edie Winslow on Eddie's vote for me buttons. Uh, I found it to be fucking hysterical once again. Um, And look, I would would have argued that they should have just gone with that. I think that that will get people's attention because you look at a button that says vote for Edie and then you look at somebody who normally would not be named ed and it's like wait what wait wait, why like it makes people ask you questions and thus you could kind of give them your pitch from there i know it's a fucked up way of doing it but like let's change the name now for the rest of the show ed winslow let's do it (laughs) i didn't think of that that is brilliant i did not think of it that way Keep in mind that I, I've spent like maybe like six or seven hours today editing uh, our long ass episode 17 recap. So maybe this is partially coming out of uh, a, a craziness right now. But um, I think that uh, Edie, like especially like with how like tall and manly and deep voice that Eddie is trying to be, like just contrasting that with, oh, hey, I'm Edie. Like I think that would be great. That is fantastic. And if you're familiar with Grey Gardens, anybody who is, and you you get the joke hearing Edie, I love it. John, we got to watch Grey Gardens one day and you will understand that. I thought you were talking about like an amusement park in Virginia. I think there's an amusement park in Virginia that's also called Grey Gardens. This sounds like you go there to lynch people. 
No, 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 no. Um, I think, no, I'm sorry. I got to confuse Bush Gardens. It's Bush Gardens. <laughs> I was like, wait, why are you talking about an amusement park in Virginia? Wait, is there, is there really a place to lynch people called a Grey Gardens? What? It, it, a Grey Garden sounds like a place where you go to lynch somebody. I would never want to visit there. I'm not taking my family. That is not a real place. I hope not. And Grey Gardens is a movie with a character named Little Edie, and she is hilarious. And you want me to watch a TV show that's named after for a possible lynching place in Virginia? This is a movie, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I like how Eddie in this scene is doing a slightly quicker version of Judy's no line that we had from the previous scene. Laura is insisting that, you know, she be his campaign manager instead of Rodney. Eddie is like, okay, Laura, let me think about it. And then, she, and then Eddie gives Rodney a deadpan look, like a deadpan disappointed look, and then goes back to Laura. Okay, yeah, you're, you're hired, like without hesitation. So I love that moment. It was great. Uh, and another quick scene is ended there. We go to scene four, Rachel in the kitchen holding baby Richie, baby talk explaining to him about recycling when there's like, God, I mean, did you count how many cans of recycling there were in there? I think there were like 10 or 15. I I think it was eight in total, but it, there were more in the background too. So maybe there was 15. Yeah. I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, I know there's a big family in that house, but as someone who's used to seeing like one or two recycling cans, seeing like 10 or so around makes you want to go crazy. I mean, that's talk about a way to like really like jolt your anxiety. Hey, now I'm going to ask you if you would have the same reaction I have. I have at my building here, there are three recycling bins and three garbage bins. When I see all three recycling bins, I like get a panic attack because I'm like, who put what in what? I don't know where it goes. And I feel like I don't understand how to use them. How does it make you feel? I would say my equivalent is like Thursday night or Friday morning here in Vermont. Because here in our town of Richford, uh, we have this system where trash, like the trash man comes every Friday. The recycling people come every other Friday for some reason, as if, you know, we, we, we don't use a lot of recycling and it needs to be taken out every week. Uh, so I, I mean, the trash part of it, when it's just trash Friday, that's fine. But when you combine trash and recycling, you know how it is. Like trash is just a trash bag. And then recycling all of a sudden, you got cans, you got pieces of cardboard, you got uh, whatever else, and it, you, it begins to stack up to the point where there's no room in the can. You got to leave some stuff on the floor. So you imagine like, oh my God, like I got to be out there with all this stuff at the front by eight o'clock on Friday morning. How am I going to do this? I don't want to wake up early for this. Sometimes I come home late from work on Thursday night to try to do it. And it's like, oh, I can't do it. I get so yeah, that's my equivalent. I think what we've learned here is that fuck recycling when it gets full. I am with you and I'm not even going to add in compost because we have a composting thing here and I still don't understand how to use that. Yeah, so that was a new thing when I moved to Vermont. Um, when I was in Connecticut and Iowa, never a thing. It was simply trash and recycling. But when I first moved to Vermont, the first place that I lived in here, uh, the woman that I lived with, uh, she was always taking out compost. We, you know, and, and that was a new thing to me because I thought like, oh, banana peels and used uh, apple seeds or whatever, like you just put it in the trash. But the fact that it like, oh, wow, in addition to trash and recycling, there's this separate thing for food scraps and you always have to put it in there. And ugh, God, so I haven't done that since moving out. And I'm glad because I just think, you know, put it in the trash. <laughs> Just put it in the trash, people. I still don't get composting. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And, and then like at the recycling center, like you have to do that thing where you have to like, you know, uh, get like a shovel full of sand and put it over your compost and everybody else's compost. It's a whole process. And it's like, just throw it in the trash. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we are uh, done with our recycling rant. And mm -hmm. I love that the callback in this scene uh, that the studio audience didn't pick up on. So like when Rachel is encouraging baby Richie to say like, oh, recycle, say environmentalist. And then when that doesn't work, remember when Rachel got snappy and was like, okay, can you say mama? And I was like, oh, <laughs> hey, there was an episode where like fucking 70% of the time Rachel was forcing Richie to say mama. But you know, the timid, the, the rather timid response from the mm -hmm. studio audience, they didn't get that. They, they don't they don't catch up with the episodes week to week like we do, Andrew. They didn't get it. And I think they were distracted by Baby Richie because Baby Richie, whatever what was in that can that they had him holding on to in the beginning of the scene, I want to know what was in there. And I couldn't find anything on Google. So if anybody knows what was in that can, because that baby was obsessed with that thing. It was Black Plague. Uh, 
uh, liquid. Ooh, spreading the plague. <laughs> Fashion trend. Yeah. Uh, if you want to kill somebody uh, in the most unexpected way possible, have a baby hold the poisonous item. They'll never know it's coming. Tips for assassins. You heard it here. <laughs> you heard it here first. I think this is also the scene where Harriet is wearing sweats and heels. Is that what I saw? Did she, was she wearing was... sweats and heels? <laughs> <laughs> he had on the high heels and sweats. I couldn't stop looking at her. <laughs> I was like, okay, Harriet, because like many times she's been a trendsetter, like nobody's business. But for even for Harriet, I was like, sweats and heels? Like that's, and, and, and I think she even had stockings underneath the sweats too. Like that's a choice. It's a choice. And I feel bad for her because that had to be so uncomfortable. Get her some sneakers. Like nobody had sneakers for her to wear. I don't know. Do you, so you, you, don't, you, you don't think it was Joe Marie's choice. You think that's like some uh, a costume person was just like, oh, you know, we got to give some classiness still to Harriet, even though she's around the house. Let's put the heels with the sweats. It, I, it's because of the stockings that were with the heels. If you've ever worn a pair of stockings, you don't want a pair of sweatpants over your legs and stockings. You might as well just be roasting a chicken down there. So <laughs> I can only imagine how uncomfortable she had to feel. Yeah. Okay. So poor Joe Marie, if she was forced to to do that because that was god that was something anyway all right so carl is looking through the last of rachel's recycling cans and you know at the last of the recycling can he's just like oh god whoa what's that smell and rachel says it's dirty diapers and question came into my head i was like wait a minute can you recycle dirty diapers and according to google they say that disposable diapers were not designed for recycling maybe there's non-disposable baby diapers that i'm not aware of but at least the disposable kind you're not supposed to recycle the disposable kind because they contain many different materials like paper, plastic, absorbent material. They're, of course, contaminated with human waste. And there have been attempts to recycle them, but it's been with very limited success. So I have no idea if you had any knowledge about that. I did not have knowledge about recycling baby diapers. I would not want anything that was recycled from a baby diaper. I'm all good on that. There are cloth diapers, which are not disposable. So if you have a baby, sometimes people will be fancy and they give you little cloth diapers. There used to be diaper pickup for those and they would wash the cloth diapers and return them to you. I don't know if they do that anymore though. There are still reusable and cloth diapers out there if you're interested. So anytime I think about cloth diapers, I think about like, you know, when people dress up as Greek gods for like a very like alcohol ridden college party, maybe they have those cloth diapers or um, maybe like, I don't know, like fucking Moses back in his day wore a cloth diaper. Like I just, I feel like cloth diaper that's like a very old school adult thing or am i wrong okay i have a bad joke here <laughs> oh. moses did not wear cloth diapers because he parted the red sea so those cheeks were free out there <laughs> <laughs> oh god god damn you moses like this motherfucker should have known that when he parted the red sea that there was going to be a million like fucking uh pms jokes that might have came years ahead he, he just didn't have the fortitude to understand it but if you can part water you better be able to wipe between the cheeks so you don't need a diaper but <laughs> the other people now i've been to greek college parties and they do wear the cloth diapers but it's mostly because the guys wearing those are going to get blackout drunk and probably piss on themselves so that's why they wear those so they're as insane as i've seen them on tv like they're they're oh. really butt shit crazy oh yeah the ones that i've been to i was like never again i will not do this and then i went to another the first time you see somebody throw themselves through a wooden door you're like I'm sold. Let's get into it. Let's go. Wait a minute. Like they, so, so they run into a wooden door, like, and they, they break the wooden door and they're not hurting. They're not bleeding or anything like that from that impact. Oh, they're probably hurt. They're probably bleeding. They don't care because they're drunk. <laughs> they are just running into this door the same way. If you've ever seen the videos of people diving into tables in the middle of a parking lot off the top of a car during a tailgate, they just do it. And they're just like, yeah, I broke my arm. It's like, okay. Jesus Christ. <laughs> God. Anywho, we have another quick scene ending there. Uh, we have scene five. What are you laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking of your phlegm. <laughs> yeah. And last episode, you guys don't know what we're talking about right now because you haven't heard it yet. But Oh, they will hear this because it was the last episode. <laughs> 
I will say that I prepared going into this recording. I sucked on a lemon mint drop because I find that that can help with phlegm. I gargled my dry mouth rinse because I've heard that that can also kind of help with phlegm. I ate fairly minimally for dinner. I was thinking like, oh God, I really want to go for my fake Ben and Jerry's, but mm, Andrew and I, we're going to talk and I don't want to be coughing phlegm like every two seconds. So I didn't go for my fake Ben and Jerry's. Okay. Uh, so I think there's that because I'm just so stuffed up all the time. Like if I talk for a long period of time, like <clears throat> a coating is always going to come out, you know? Like sometimes I can just like not talk for a long period of time and everything is fine. But then you get me talking and all of a sudden, like the juices in me just start acting up. It's like, oh, okay, we're moving. We're we're talking. We're flavoring. <laughs> They're just lubricating you. You're just getting ready to express those vocal announcements. <laughs> I, I even I even space heated the room. I thought that like, oh, if maybe if, if the room is warmer, that mm-hmm. makes things moist and more digestible. I, I, don't, I don't know. I had crazy theories about how this would work and it's still not working. You're probably right. Look, I, this is the only time I've heard you clear your throat tonight. So you're right. Something is working. Oh, I'm resisting. No, no, no. I, I, there's many, been many times in this conversation that I want to clear my throat. I'm, I'm, I'm resisting. I am doing the equivalent of the girl that is holding her pee for God knows how long as she's drinking and drinking and drinking all throughout the night. I'm, I'm doing that party girl resistance. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? Because you know, because you know that party white girl shit where they're like, they'll just drink and drink and drink and they'll have a good time and then you all of a sudden like they're holding 20 hours worth of pee and it's like what the fuck is go what go pee you can't go pee because if you go pee thing you can't stop you have to pee all night long now what do you call it skunking or raccooning what do you call it i've never heard of any of these terms what no no what do you what do you call it when you oh it's a what's the term that everybody uses when you have to hold your pee in and if you don't you keep on peeing all night long what's the term oh i don't know what the term's called i always said breaking the seal there you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. So how ah. I had raccooning and skunking, but no, it's breaking the seal. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> I knew it was some animal. I knew it was some animal. Anywho, we go to scene five. Scene opening with Carl finding a, a coupon for a free sushi dinner. You like sushi, right? I okay. like sushi so much. Yeah, I, I initially was like, oh, God, God, raw fish, that tastes or sounds disgusting. And then I think I tried it for the first time when I used to live out in the Midwest. And it was actually not bad. It was not bad. It's, it's, it's pretty good shit. And then Harriet was telling him that, you know, he hates raw fish. Carl is, of course, saying that dad joke. Well, like, hey, I'll, you know, just get the sushi to go and I'll just cook it at home. I don't know if you could do that. Like, can you do that smoothly with sushi? Oh, you can? Yeah, you can. You can do that. All you do is take the raw fish off and just pop it in a pan or something. I laughed at that joke because I see myself doing that because I am that cheap. If I have a free coupon, I'm taking whatever it is and I'm going to change it at home. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Uh, so, it, yes, it was a cute moment from Carl and Harriet. I thought that given what the objective objective of this scene was what it turned into i thought like oh it just seemed like a very like brief unnecessary thing that we could have done away with uh but because it's carl and harriet they still sell it as this cute husband and wife moment so eddie is coming in like of course i'm noticing this dude is like fucking seven feet tall he's got this double-breasted suit on it's a little too big for him of course it's the 90s and he's ready for his freshman class election and um <clears throat> this is where the charm comes in andrew that you were speaking of he's got this unnatural deep voice as he's practicing his pitch to Carl and Harriet. And I think as Eddie came in, I heard like a brief woo from the audience in regards to his suit. I wonder if that was Sarah, our, our lovely studio audience member, Sarah, from the last episode, who was screaming for Urkel. It might have been screaming Sarah because it was one specific person who was like, ooh. Yeah, Sarah or Chandra Lita, who is the more exotic audience member who likes Family Matters. I don't know. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Anyway, so Eddie snaps Carl with his uh, vote for me pin button. Carl, of course, is like, ow! Well, son, other than bleeding, I'm impressed. Were you wondering, like, I was, like, as Carl moved on, I was thinking, like, wait a minute, Carl, like, what if you are really bleeding? Maybe you should go, like, get a band-aid really quick before you finish the scene. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was thinking about that. Like, it's what happened here? Because that pen was actually sharp on that button. Did you yeah. see it? Like, look at it. It was like pretty sharp. And I'm like, is he okay? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. And you know, look, you, you had mentioned that like you were liking like, you know, Harriet getting into Eddie's charm. I liked it when she initially had that like, oh, you know, politicians are fake. You 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 can't convince me, boy, energy toward Eddie. Um, and I and I thought that could have been explored further rather than just her giving in fairly quickly to his 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 charm because it's like that dynamic of like oh the mom the type of parent the type of adult that you see that's lived enough of a life where anything a politician says they don't buy unless it's actually done but what if that politician was your son what if that politician was someone that you got out of your vagina and you have this love and affection for and you want to see him grow and succeed what does that do like do you still have that like oh fuck your bs or do you just kind of fake it because they're your son and you want to support them every step of the way that is an interesting question i'm probably going to be like hey son you're like a shitty politician. But if you're going to sell shit, you're going to be the best at selling shit to people. Even when Eddie's just like, hey, I'm Eddie. How you doing? I want to run for president. I want your vote. And by the way, you're looking good today. Like, that's literally what his message was. <laughs> but he ran on a campaign platform that would have done him very well in this time period. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, and then Carl and Harriet abruptly uh, exit with... <laughs> I found it very weird that how they exited. They were like, oh my God, Harriet, we, 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 we got a free movie coupon and it's good until six tonight. Let's go. Like, I, I felt like there were there could have been a more gradual, smooth way that they exited, but it was just like, no, we got a free movie coupon. All right, guys, let's go. It made me think, and I was hoping Eddie would have reacted like, damn, they just don't care about me at all. Like I was waiting for some of that feedback to happen and it didn't happen, but it was an abrupt way to leave. It, yeah. I, look, I, you like free shit. I like free shit. Would you have that quick urgency of Carl and Harriet where it's, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. If it's to a movie, movies cost $900 to see in theater. So if I can get it for free, I am going as soon as it's available. So if it's like you're coming home, you're tired as fuck, it's like 4.30 and there's a coupon that says, this coupon is good till 5.30, free movie tonight, and it's, I don't know, Star Trek or whatever you're into, you're going no matter how tired you are. I am going and I thought about time back then. Did you ever go to the movies like early 90s? Like I would say like 95, 96 ish. You know, I honestly do not re like the earliest movie that I can remember is like early 2000s going to see Star Wars episode two. I probably have gone to the movies in the 90s, but I can't remember that far back. See, the only reason why I ask is because I remember going to the movies when I was younger, like 95, 96, where we'd get to the movies and there'd be this long line outside of the movie theater. And it wasn't even like a brand new movie premiere. It was just like, it's Friday night and everybody's at the movie theater. And if you had a coupon, you got in first. Other people had to wait. So that's the only reason why I could think that they would run out like that. But again, it was super weird and abrupt. And a lot of the transitions in this episode feel that way. Mm, okay. So in this scene, we have Eddie uh, genuinely, genuinely wanting to be the next day in quail, Laura telling him he shouldn't be saying that in public. You know, you have to remember that, you know, Dan Quayle was the guy that was like, oh, hey, he, he said something about like all of America should take after Murphy Brown. And Murphy Brown was a popular TV show on CBS at the time. And the joke was like, why the fuck is Dan Quayle giving us like serious vice presidential advice based on a popular television series? I do know that uh, Johnny Carson was certainly very grateful to Dan Quayle when he was wrapping up his 30 year reign on The Tonight Show, because I think it was uh, during the, the 92 election season where Dan Quayle's dumbness was really, really in the spotlight as him and HW were going up against Bill Clinton and Al Gore. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I got it. It's one thing uh, to have the kids in 1990 be like, well, who are you talking about? But imagine in 2024, like watching Family Matters and just being like Henry Kissinger, Dan Quayle, like, are, are these the names of jellies and jams? Like, what, what is this? It, I can only imagine being so confused, so confused. The fact that you brought up something. I didn't realize this, that John, you just created a correlation in my head that Dan Quell referenced Murphy Brown in a speech. And you know 
who also later referenced a movie in a speech, Ooh. George W. Bush took the final lines from the Pokemon 2000 movie. No, I'm sorry. The Pokemon got to be a master movie, not 2000, and mm-hmm. used those lines in a speech of his. And and I and I forgot to establish that parallel between Dan Quayle and George W. Bush. Like, yeah. Both of them. What I like about both of them is that they are both guys that you could have a beer with, but at the same time, they're that type of guy where it's like, yeah, I could hang out with you, but you're not the brightest fellow in the world. Like, I'm not hanging out with you because of your intelligence. I'm just hanging out with you because you're just a common every man who I can have fun with. We can make some stupid jokes. But would I want your hand on a nuclear button? Eh, I don't know about that. Get that chance in this world. <laughs> so Rodney is coming in to announce he's arranged a, a, a debate between Eddie and his opponent, Margie. And it brings about a couple of thoughts in me. One, Rodney, again, not a good friend because what the hell Eddie wasn't give it a heads up like talk about it with Eddie first before officially scheduling this debate and two I thought isn't this something that Laura should have done as the campaign manager I thought that Rodney was sacked and all of a sudden he is still running things and at least at the end of this scene Laura seemed to be fine with it she seemed to be casual about it Laura seemed very whimsical she didn't really have a care you brought up something that I didn't even think about Laura should have been the one to put that together and then on top of that Laura should have done some opposition research she had no opposition research at all she was very like she had very much the potential to be a great smart campaign manager like you look at her A's you look at her thirst for excellence and competition like laura is pitching herself as eddie's campaign manager okay i'm in i already know what you're all about laura but she approaches it very eddie like and i was kind of surprised by that so we go to scene six uh, where i was really confused because now we go from like laura seeming okay by rodney's thing to just now choking him <laughs> like he's i was like oh wait wait how did you go from like this to that that was some weird like schizophrenic kind of shit then i kind of got kind of went down this sort sarcastic road of just saying to myself like oh what a great campaign manager Laura is because she's led Eddie to believe that she can get him to win and then once this debate comes she's like oh shit we got nothing now we got to make stuff up which is basically what a lot of your like what, what a lot of your average stupid politician has done like I want to get into this because I can be the person for your country and then when the shit hits the fan oh my god we got to talk about real things and real issues that people care about and want to talk about oh crap all right where's my powerpoint it's 2020 all over again that's all it is <laughs> and then rodney is uh, doing the like, remember that finger trick that you you always get as a child like oh you know what's that on your shirt and then whoop, you do the finger up the nose and everything mm-hmm. um, but what i loved about rodney doing the finger trick on urkel like urkel was just laughing along with rodney as if like urkel didn't know that the joke is on him and i found it to be a little bit of a weird moment but i also was like you know what good for you urkel because it kind of gave me that vibe of like you know what you're not gonna laugh at me i can laugh at myself like you just take that power away from the bully and you make it your own thing yeah urkel really empowered himself in that moment i didn't think about that but he really did and then urkel um again like another episode dressed like a retirement home old man on a walk like he was wearing a jacket and like some exotic vacation shirt under with the suspenders um it it was it it was a lot god bless his grandfather for dressing him up because that's what it looked like it really did it, I typically like his sweaters. I didn't even like his sweater in this episode. So here was a weird moment. So Urkel, like, he, he I, I guess Eddie and Laura, they're talking about Margie. Urkel is confused. And then he, like, realizes, like, oh, yeah, the Margie that you're talking about in your election debate discussion, I know who she is. Like, yeah, she's running for Frosh Prez. Remember that? I don't know what that meant. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean it, it clearly means freshman president, but I, I, I think I had to, like, replay that. I was like, Frosh? Fresh Prez. <laughs> that seemed like a very weird, cool way to say freshman president. I had no idea what he was saying. And now that you've said it slow enough, it makes sense. I was like, that's got to be like some kind of mistake or something. And I just skipped past it. That's what the kids are saying, man. It's like um, how the kids say uh, Stan. Like I'm a Beyonce Stan. What's Stan short for? Oh, I wonder. All right. That's not a good example. Um, oh, I, I am. Oh, oh, I, I ship this. That, that, that I ship this crap where it's where 
ship is short for relationship. Have you ever heard that when people say, I ship this? Damn, I'm old. I have no idea what that is. What? Yeah, I thought I was old, but no, no. Yeah, that's the thing that people say is uh, when, I don't know, like take uh, Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. Like, oh my God, they're back together. I ship this. It's the stupidest thing. <laughs> Whoa, my mind is blown. Oh my yeah. God. Okay, I think I've probably been reading multiples post very wrong. Oh my God. And then we have two lines from Marco on this scene that can remind you how much of an animated creep he is. Uh, did you remember like when Laura was like saying she has an idea and Urkel is like, oh, it doesn't involve you and me alone on a desert island. So creepy. So <laughs> creepy. <laughs> so creepy. I know. And then uh, Laura is kicking Urkel out and he's smushed up on the back porch door with his goofy nerd face screaming, thank you for a lovely evening. <laughs> He's so weird. Much. I mean, he's weird. Like, he, he has his funny moments, and then he has moments where I'm like, all right, buddy boy, you're a little bit intense here. We need to call the cops on this one. That, that's weird. What do you what do you do first? Do you call the cops, or do you call child services on Herbert Diane? Like, where, where do you go? I, I'm calling the cops because the problem <laughs> is present in my home. That's the problem. I, the, what created the problem? Y'all can go check that out. <laughs> So that's the cops' responsibility. Once the cops arrest Urkel and then find out why he is crazy, it's on them to contact child services on Herb and Diane. Yes, I just need you to secure my household so this child is not in here. Got it, got it. All right, so we go to scene seven and uh, damn Laura, she's got a savage line here as she's massaging Eddie's shoulders in preparation for the debate. We're at the school right now. Uh, she's like, remember, Eddie, smile and avoid the issues. In other words, act like a president. Perfect line. I thought, did you find it strange that there was no applause uh, when Eddie took to the stage when he was walking? Like you could hear the clicking of his shoes. Like, I don't yeah. know. I felt like there was there, there should have been more of a presentation as he walked up to the stage. There should have been. For each person, they should have gotten a clap or something when they were introduced or walked out. Because I don't think Margie walked out. I think she was already there. Yeah, she was already there. Yeah. And you would have thought that... When with Eddie being popular, that he would have gotten a, like a, a, a round of applause, a rump roast of a support from the crowd of students. But yes, but no, it was just polite silence. And then uh, Rodney leads the chant of "Win slow, win slow," and it just reminded me of like, wow, that's that's really dumb, but it accurately describes politics to a T. Is you just find uh, your charm, you know, whether it be your looks, your suit, whatever, and if you could just say a few basic English language words, like, I'll look into it. I understand you. I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Like, that's that's all you need. In today's election atmosphere, yeah, that's all you need. You need wall, immigrant. You say those three words, boom. It's a America first. Ooh, I feel disgusting saying that. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. You pump that out, boom, you got your crowd. Andrew, you say America first, all of a sudden, I'm going to walk up to your apartment and I'm going to see several American flags hoisted and I'm going to be turned the fuck off. <laughs> I'm coming out with my American flag beater, my American flag shorts, and you know what I'm also going to have on my head? An American flag bandana. Oh, damn. <laughs> The irony, like you're showing how patriotic you are representing the country of supposed freedom, but like, no, it's, it's, you're, you're showing the opposite. The more patriotic you show yourself. There you go. That's what happens. Just show the opposite. By the way, anybody who wears the American flag, you're actually breaking the law because that's illegal. You got to read the constitution. That's actually right. very illegal to wear the American flag. It is illegal. I guess I'm going to change what I'm wearing on Tuesday. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I love my country too damn much. Anyway, Margie is giving a well thought out response to the debate question at hand. Uh, Rodney, of course, being the cruel son of a bitch he is, she, you know, he's shouting, boo, sit down, Flegman. Makes me not like him anymore. So fuck you, Rodney. Yeah, can't stand. I actually don't like the scene. Um, I can't stand him at all. Yeah. Uh, Eddie decides to compliment the questioner's uh, outfit. You know, I, you know, I, yeah, I love that moment. You know, the debate questioner is just asking a common political question. And Eddie's like, yeah, 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 I hear you. And by the way, you are looking really nice in that crop top today or whatever the fuck she was wearing. Uh, and then he just says he's proud to be an American. Of course, that's uh, how many politicians have we said? Yes, it's nice to be in the great state of Iowa. This is where real American values are like that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. 
the best stuff that gets people going. Yeah, the, the, the question is not actually answered by Eddie. And uh, Rodney, I think he still leads that sh- sh- chant. Eddie, Eddie, from the student audience. And... Um, you know, poor Margie. I'm like feeling so bad for her throughout because she has a very shocked and hurt face uh, at all the support for Eddie and like literally nothing for her. I thought that there was some studio audience laughter that was placed there where it shouldn't be. Like, I think this was after, you know, the Eddie, 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 Eddie chant um, because you know, Mar- Margie, there's a moment where she gives an intelligent answer indicating that the students will have to put in hard work. That's greeted with a rude chance of no work, no work, no work from the student crowd. So I think that, yeah, it was that moment actually that had the studio audience laughter afterwards. So of course that studio audience laughter is indicating to us that this should be funny. I didn't find it funny. I thought that Margie's nerd delivery really indicated that it shouldn't be funny because think about it, like how different would it be if it was Urkel up there with his animated personality delivering his points and he was interrupted the way he did like would you be more likely to laugh or not what's your opinion if it was Urkel up there I still wouldn't laugh I actually didn't find the scene funny at all and the weird laugh track they added in there because it did not sound like studio laughter made it even weirder the whole scene for me is cringe so I did not enjoy it and as a viewer even younger this would not have made me laugh yeah yeah honestly I think that Urkel with his infectious goofiness he could have had the potential um to give me a chuckle here and there despite the the brevity of the moment if if there's no other better word I could use but Urkel is not there it's Margie and Margie and Urkel could not be two more different kind of nerds Urkel of course is very out there animated possesses like a certain crazy competence very comical margie is the type of nerd that you've seen before where they're just very shy they seem socially awkward they definitely don't seem confident in themselves so you feel for them pretty easily when you know you got dumb eddie you know taking over with his lines that have no substance to them and then, yeah 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 student audience cheers and margie is getting nothing when she's presenting really well thought out ideas forget about her personality yeah she could use some work on that but she's providing substance. Maybe we should take a moment and listen to that. So yeah, I thought it was very weird how the show's production chose to be like, oh yeah, we find this funny, we're picking on the nerd, when really it was a, seemed like more of a sad moment. Yeah, they, this I'm not gonna get too deep into it because it's a part of my rating, but it is one of those moments where I was just like, oh, I can see that you're trying to build humor, but it was done so poorly that it just felt uncomfortable to watch. We move on to scene eight. Carl is wearing a gray and black clover leaf sweater with blue jeans and black dress shoes. Awkward. I don't know. How would you rate that with Harriet's sweaters or sweats and heels? I'm going to say that that is the equivalent of Harriet's sweatpants with her heels. But (laughs) Harriet was at least a little more fashionable than Carl. Carl reminds me of like the dad that you see in the middle of Walmart going through a book of receipts or something where you're like, who is this guy? What is he about to do? Oh, like he you like he saved all these receipts because he thinks it's going to be good for his taxes. Mm-hmm. Like he's got like a book of receipts, just like I am ready to claim everything. I have like a whole shit ton of receipts on the top drawer of my dresser drawer because I thought like, oh, I think I've heard that they'll save me money during tax time. Nah. I mean, tax time has already passed for this year and my wife is like, you can throw those away. (laughs) It's just, it's just scrunched up paper balls that you have where you should have your underwear, dear. (laughs) At this point, you just gotta let it go. Let them go. Oh, we like to hoard things, us bad people. So Carl and Harriet, they're just flabbergasted by the amount of recycling Rachel has collected that is taking up space in the kitchen. And then Carl opens the pantry and we suddenly get a shit ton mountain, a shit show mountain of empty cans falling on him. Goodness gracious. The only thing I was thinking of was the props department. Like the amount of time that it must have taken for them to put all those cans stacked up as high as they were in the pantry. That's what 
was first and foremost in my mind. I mean, and this is probably because of my uh, theater background, knowing what goes on behind the scenes of these types of things. Like that was that must have been a lot of work for the props people. Uh, I had no idea. Is there a mechanism that they use or it's kind of you just got to get them behind that door without them all falling on you? I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a system. Maybe they uh, rolled a bunch of cans on a dolly cart. Maybe they made it convenient for themselves in some way, but uh, it's 1990. So maybe it was just very man manual. Maybe they just had like four, five, six people like, hey, take 15 or 20 cans a person and just stack them, stack them, stack them, stack them in the pantry. And then I thought there was a funny moment where uh, Rachel enters through the back porch door and nervously greets Carl and Harriet because she knows they're not liking all this recycling. And then that moment where Carl is just <laughs> walking through all the cans on the floor, you hear the sound of all the cans. And then right next to Harriet, Carl is just looking at Rachel intently. Why? And then um, this is where I thought that I felt like the recycling story would have been better for Judy, especially when Carl uh, says to Harriet about Rachel, like, how did your parents ever survive this woman's wonder years? Because, yeah, it, it's a valid question. Like, if Rachel is acting like this right now, can you imagine how she was as a kid? I can only imagine. She had to be even worse. So then we go to scene nine, back to the debate. Of course, it's a dumb Eddie thing, and it's even and it's, an, and it's an even dumber audience thing when Rodney still leads a chant, but but I am growing to like it because it's promoting intelligence rather than simple-minded popularity, the way they're handling this so far. So I think I'm kind of getting along with the message here. Mm -hmm. uh, so the students are cruelly chanting nerd, nerd, nerd to Margie as she's trying to speak. And you can tell that her shy self doesn't know how to handle it. And thankfully, oh my God, superhero Eddie, he steps in to stop all this and defend Margie's good ideas that are worth listening to. This was the moment where you were almost going to be girl this is where girl makes her appearance mm -hmm. uh eddie is admitting uh, on stage that he's only in this election to get girls and then there's girl in the crowd that stands up i love you eddie <laughs> and then uh we get that moment where eddie is like he's smiling he's like oh some hot chick recognizes me and then he just like refocuses right back to the important message at hand i thought that was great and then you know good for eddie for having margie's back i mean he he's he decided to drop out out and support her run for class president. But this is where the show production, I thought, handled it confusingly. You have the sappy background music. You have Laura being surprised. You have the student crowd looking disappointed. So when you have all that into play, in addition to Eddie walking away from the auditorium to zero response from our, from our studio audience, I thought that would have been worthy of an applause from a studio audience. But no, it just seemed like this very sad, dramatic moment. It could have been more of a celebration for Margie. It should have been. Like, it should have been a celebration for Margie. It should have been, see, oh, my God, I'm so frustrated with this part of the story. It should have been a celebration for Margie. Ugh, what's his name? Rico. Rodney could have like done like a little chant and like Margie, Margie or something. Like we could have had a happy ending here and it ended so awkwardly. I'm disgusted. Just so y'all know, I did not like the end of that scene. Yeah, it, it was um, disgusting. And what's even more disgusting is now I want Eddie's friend to be named Rico instead of Rodney. Like you really got me with Rico there. <laughs> Come on now, Rico Gonzalez. If he was a Rico, I'd be like, okay, we can keep him i feel like he might be a good character because rico would know better he would be getting beat at home like don't go out there and do the stupid stuff you're doing so scene 10 our another episode with a fucking scene 10 what is up with these 10 scenes now i think because like we're doing scenes so quickly the show has an excuse to have more scenes mm -hmm. they want this faster paced narrative that i'm starting to pick up where it's just go 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 mm -hmm. by the way we're at the winslow living room when this is happening so absolute irony of laura being disappointed at Eddie for dropping out because he would have won. And that's the only important thing. And Eddie being the one to lecture Laura that, you know, winning shouldn't be based on dirty tricks like this. I thought like, wait, what? You thought it would be the other way around. Like Laura should be the one that's smart enough to be like, you know what? No, Eddie, winning is the the the, the, the integrity is more important than winning. But yeah, it, the, this was an example of like, wow, I guess we just sort of forgot of the intelligence that Laura should have. Yes. And I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. And it's going to be a part of my rating. So I will let you finish because I want to talk about this in my rating. Okay. Um, I thought it kind of made sense that Laura was very into the idea of, it kind of makes sense that Laura was into the idea of winning at all costs. I 
do you see, you know, she's perfect straight A student. She has unfiltered competitiveness. She has a hungry drive that can certainly border on becoming an evil villain. So I could see that, but I don't know, something about it, something about her naivete when Eddie decided to take that high road, it still kind of struck me funny. That's all I got for this episode. Your rating system, uh, Andrew. Well, first of all, explain what the rating system is for people who are just getting in new to this. Um, so our rating system, it based on four parts of a meal, four parts of a meal that you could get anywhere through Grubhub, Uber Eats, or DoorDash, or your local Red Lobster. That is fresh lobster from the sea. Uh, please just get it from Uber Eats or DoorDash. Fuck Grubhub, because they still have me on a wait list. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, Grubhub, you suck, because I'm on the wait list, too. <laughs> so you suck. I hope you don't get orders. <laughs> but you can get an appetizer. Appetizers are first part of our rating. That is the start of your meal. What really brought you into this episode? What made you say, hey, I'm ready to sit down and have another plate of something? Then we got our entree. That is the main course of the meal. What really filled you up? What gave you your sustenance? What made you feel like, I'm good. I can unbuckle my belt and just relax at the table after this. And then we get to dessert, which is like the cherry on top. What was like your little highlight of this episode, the thing that really just topped off your meal. And then the last part of it, we have junk food. Junk food is nothing. It's worth nothing. It's like eating. Oh my God. If anybody still eats Pringles, it's like eating a Pringle and expecting to get nutrients from it. There is no nutrients in a Pringle. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me, let me interject. There are no nutrients in a Pringle, but sometimes like a salt and vinegar Pringle hits. Okay. You know what? I will give that to you. The flavors can hit, but if you've eaten a Pringle, just know that you have ingested paper. Pringles are paper. And, and try almost choking on a Pringle because, of course, the curves, the curves will always make you choke. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm talking about a Pringle. That's all I'm talking about. Uh, Pringle did not pop up in my head. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> oh, God. We got a penis shaped like a Coca-Cola bottle. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, that would be a fun time. <laughs> yeah, it would. It would. Anyway, I'm sorry. To get back to our uh, supposedly family-friendly recap. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's your rating system for the episode. So let's talk about our ratings now. Um, this is an interesting one for me. Uh, as far as my appetizer, my appetizer was the cold open reference to the sculpture I talked about earlier. This was the moment where it pulled me into the episode right away where I was kind of like, whoa, I'm getting something that can then connect to my real life that's happening in the show right now. It's actually not bad because it's actually a pretty good joke on, in my head, how did somebody sculpt this with somebody standing in that position for as long as they've stood in it? Again, the sculpture itself is called the Discobolus. All you have to do is spell disco and then type in sculpture next to it. It will come up to you in Google. That's the easiest way to find it if you want to see what it looks like. But that really drew me into the episode because I made that connection. I was like, oh shit, it's art history. This is what I remember about school. And I loved that portion of it. The entree for me was Rachel's obsession. Rachel's obsession was like so good to me of just collecting the cans, recycling, turning the house into a recycling center. I just was like, we need this as a full episode because I am addicted to hoarders. And if you have seen hoarders, you know how hoarders looks, you know what happens, and you know there's some good juiciness in there. Now, part of this that is making this my entree is the fact that we never addressed any of this in the episode. Everyone's kind of just like, oh, Rachel, you just get out of hand and things go too far. And it's like, no, we really need to talk about the fact that Rachel has something going on and is not addressing it. And the family is not addressing it either. She has cost them tons of money, has destroyed property, has ransacked their home, has destroyed their lives over and over again for this obsession for her to succeed or just have her hand in everything. And at the end of the episode, we get Rachel and her horde coming into the final scene. And the final scene, we've got Eddie and Laura after they talk and Eddie opens up the living room closet door and tons of cans come falling out of it. So it's like, how many cans did Rachel hide around this house? And if you know about hoarding and hoarding behaviors, this is one of the things that happens. 
there's all this mess that gets cleaned up after you finally catch the order. And then boom, we find their secret stash. That closet was Rachel's secret stash. We never addressed it. I needed it addressed, but it still fit into my entree because it just left me wanting a little bit more. You know what I'm going to say this is? This entree was one that I'm going to send back to the kitchen. It's got to go back. We got to get a little more seasoning on this. We have to develop these flavors a little bit more because it was really a good opportunity. My dessert, there is one joke and one joke only that is my dessert today. It is when Carl tries to spray that whipped cream on his thigh and Rachel screams. She screams at him. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm laughing thinking about it now. Um, she screams at him because he's using an aerosol can. And if you know aerosol cans, they put a hole in the ozone layer. So she's concerned about that. And that's what she screams about. And then when she walks away, I relate to that moment because that's me. As soon as I see something where I'm like, I told you not to do that shit. And then you go and do it because you want to eat pie. I am that person. I would walk away doing that. I want to eat some pie. <laughs> <laughs> then my last part is my junk. So my junk food is Eddie's storyline, the presidential candidate story, the class president, I thought it was junk. Um, and I thought it was junk because I didn't feel it was developed. I didn't feel that it had any sustenance in it. I didn't feel that we got much from it. Now, there are two things that I did pick up <clears throat> in, in junk food. Sometimes it tastes good like a cosmic pie, even though you know it's bad for you. The two things that I really picked up on, one to your point earlier, Laura being the person who has to hear the speech about good morals and values. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was a good thing to do because if we had developed it more, Laura took on the role of the campaign manager. Whenever you see dramas, real life, the campaign manager is the person who's pulling all the strings behind the scene. They're doing the dirty work. They're getting the opposition research. They're being messy. They're putting out terrible campaigns, all kinds of stuff. This person is a person who their job is to get dirty. And I would have loved to have seen a little bit more of that. I think feel like we didn't need Margie. Margie and the debate scene could have been cut from this completely. And we could have had Laura and Eddie focusing on his campaign in school. Laura getting him the information to get his can his opponents out of the race. And then it all culminates at the end with the vote and Eddie still loses. And mm -hmm. even though Eddie found out all this bad stuff through Laura about all the candidates, that could have been another moment for him to be like, hey, Laura, we didn't win because we didn't play fair. So or would there be, you're taking would, the high road. Wait, sorry to interrupt. Would there be any spotlight on an opponent at all like or or it would just be laser focused on eddie i wouldn't have cast an actual person to play the opponent it would have just been eddie just eddie and then we could have gotten dialogue that would have worked out between the two between rodney eddie and laura other people from school about like oh did you hear so-and-so dropped out because you did this in the campaign or something else happened that's what i wanted um and then one of the big big problems that i had well there's two big problems the first big problem that I had with the debate scene was I was just like, I feel like I'm just watching a group of people bully an actress on scene and we're just watching bullying. Like it didn't actually feel useful at all. And like it just didn't feel useful. And then my second big thing that I had an issue with with this storyline was during the debate scene when the Laura's like, oh, to Rodney, you've got all the outburst or whatever set up. And I'm like, OK, I guess we're going to get something comedic and fun here. Maybe we could have had somebody come in and give each of the kids some sweets and be like, oh, this is from Eddie. Here's cookies or something like I thought we were going to get something more comical like that. And for us to just get the kids just shouting Winslow or Eddie and all that stuff. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. This is so stupid. Kids wouldn't be that dumb to just vote for somebody because you cheer for them. It just doesn't work that way. And then my biggest problem, Eddie walked in and nobody cheered. How are you supposed to be his friends to help him get the crowd riled up? And when he walks in the door, it's dead silent. Y'all yeah. Yeah, didn't think that was a problem? Like, the, those are my things. A fantastic rating system. I, I, I thought you brought up some really, really great points. Um, I think the one that fascinated me the most was the alternative storyline of of like, let's take the opponent out, let's take Margie out, and let's like zone in on Eddie and Laura bunching together to make the best campaign possible. I do remember now the, that you brought it up that the campaign manager, I mean, essentially their job is to like really enable the dirty tricks of politics. Like how many times have you heard the campaign manager of say Trump or this other candidate like doing this or doing that or saying this on social media to really enhance their candidate and really get the negative campaigning going. So um, I think if Laura had leaned into that, if we had saw that, that would have been an interesting um, 
an interesting episode, an interesting dive into how unintegral politics can be. All right, so my appetizer, I think scene two, my appetizer, uh, and what I mean by scene two, I didn't really get a good taste, a good laugh, a good joy of the episode until that Judy line where... You know, again, she is refusing to um, do her multiplication tables silently. Laura is asking her to do it somewhere else. And she's just like, no, boom, you sold me. And it's ironic because Judy does not really play a, a central part at all in this episode. So there's potential there that could have been used for the racial recycling storyline, but we decided not to use it. That was a choice on part of the writers and producers. So for once, it seems like the cold open Urkel has nothing to do with my appetizer. I didn't really care for Urkel at all, actually, throughout this episode. Yeah, I don't think any part of my rating has anything to do with Urkel. He just didn't do anything for me. So Judy, props to you for giving me quite an appetizer with that, that line. The main course, I thought that we had a great filling main course in promoting good ideas with sub substance via the Marshy character. We're promoting what politics can be as opposed to, oh, this is the reality of what politics is, which is Eddie. And let's just keep it that way because that's what gets votes. I like as cheesy and as as naive as it can seem because, you know, how many years has it been since that episode and we're still in this dirty place with politics. But if there's anything I like about uh, the political system and how we look at it, there's always an optimism. There's always a sense of hope that we could get to a better place. And it, this episode could have very easily been like, yeah, Eddie, he wins, blah, 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 and just say, fuck Margie, you're a nerd. But no, we showed Eddie surprisingly having sympathy, looking at the fact that Margie actually deserves to spot more than him. She's actually prepared. She comes in with substance and she's rewarded in the end by Eddie dropping out and deciding to leave the floor for her. So I like that. That was a very satisfying main course for me. And I really, really hope at some point we can get to that where we have candidates that we're actually proud of, that actually have substance. Because right now we're only voting for somebody because we don't want the other person in office, as opposed to like, oh, wow, I think this person is fucking great. They're the best person. They got everything I want. That's my hope. As someone who likes American history and politics, I like looking into the background of that. And I've seen figures in the history of this country that can inspire that sort of hope. I'm hoping that we get back to that place. My dessert is the props department. As again, as someone who has worked in theater, who has seen it from the on the scene perspective and the behind the scene perspective, there was just something about seeing all those cans piled up in the pantry, in the kitchen, and the closet in the living room, and just seeing it fall out as comically as it did, both with Carl earlier in the episode and with Eddie toward the end of the episode. I think it just was a reminder of how much our behind the scenes people do not get the credit that they deserve, because a lot of work goes into that little bit of perfect comic timing. So instead of having an on the scene star become my dessert, I'm actually going to go behind the scene and say props to department. Thank you. I appreciate you because it's a fleeting moment for a majority of the audience, but for people like me who have worked in this business of show, I know what work you put in. Thank you for that. And finally, my junk food, whereas you were very much in love with the B story with Rachel and wanted to see it grow and develop into different ways and you were obsessed with it. I love that. I understand that. This is actually my junk food. I think that the B story with Rachel filling the Winslow house with recyclables as part of this ecology report that she's doing is, I just found it to be a mostly forgettable. I thought it would have been more unforgettable if we just had placed that child charm of Judy as the as the center of that story. And again, going back to what I said in the beginning, if, you know, Rachel doing this, I think if this was like the first time that she's done something this wacky, kooky, crazy, fine. But my God, I mean, we've seen this woman do wacky, kooky, crazy stuff arguably since what, episode three or four? Mm -hmm. And I know we haven't even finished a full season yet, but you know, for, for you listening, try doing with what Andrew and I do, and we're we're recapping, we're really ingesting ourselves into this show week after week after week. So if we see some repetitive traits and characters that we think could be changed with a little bit of a therapy help, then there you go. So that was my junk food. I think if we had taken that B story away completely or just replaced it with Judy, then it would have made a difference on me. But yeah, alas, this episode for me was all a story. Uh, this episode to me represented what politics can be and should be going forward. And maybe it's because we're literally doing this 
in the middle of an election year. An election year, I might add that when I read all the news coverage and stuff like that, because it's essentially a rematch of 2020, and there's not too much enthusiasm for these candidates, you don't really see that much about it, does it? Like, I think it was like February or March that it was already decided that it would be Trump and Biden again. And usually by that point, you still have like a lot of primary candidates to go through. And it was decided pretty early on in the year. Okay, we're going to be stuck with these guys again. And I don't know, maybe you, you, you see it differently, but I just, I don't really see, uh, aside from the occasional poll, like, oh, maybe Trump is leading ahead here. Maybe Biden's leading ahead there. And of course, the Trump trials stuff. Like, I don't know. I just don't see much talk about like election. We have an election coming up. I don't see much talk about the election. And forgive me if I like sound ranty for a second. I don't see a lot about the election because one, this election, you're choosing between a giant douche and a turd sandwich. Like there's not much substance that we have to choose from. And that's pretty much every election that I've been alive for that I've seen. You got a douche and you got a sandwich full of shit. Whichever one you prefer, you prefer. But I don't think I've heard much about this election because I've kind of tried to keep myself out of the sphere of it. It's just kind of been like, meh. I haven't seen much of it because I just really don't want to hear about it. Anyway, well, <laughs> that <laughs> is episode 20 of season one, The Candidates. So glad to recap another episode with you, Andrew. For those of you listening, if you have comments, concerns, questions, whatever about this, please let us know. The, 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 not that many times. I just wanted to correct myself with saying the, the, the delicious recap at gmail.com is where you can email us the delicious recap at gmail.com and at the moment we are on facebook instagram threads tiktok and youtube at family matters we watch pod like i've said before we are going to be in the process of a rebrand pretty soon so stay tuned for that but for now you can find us on all socials at family matters rewatch pod andrew how can people follow you and hopefully not send you unsolicited dick pics? You can follow me on every social <laughs> at <clears throat> AJ Vandertunt. Just type in Vandertunt. It's V-A-N-D-E-R-T-U-N-T. And you will literally find me. I will pop up. I am the only one. None of them exist. I'm the only one like Gently. And... If you're interested, at 7 p.m. Monday through Thursdays on TikTok, I go live and do a workout. So if you want to work out with me on live, that's what your opportunity is. That's awesome. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. What, like, what are you doing? Are you doing uh, are, are you doing uh, uh, bench pressing? Are you running in, in one place? What are you doing? So it's all free weight, all free weights with low impact, but repetitive movement. So you get your exercise in, you're going to get your heart rate up. I do it with a group of people. Um, Yellow Man Reed is the person who leads the class. But if you just go to my TikTok page, you'll be able to click right on my live and see the actual class. And it's pretty fun if you just want to get into working out there's no pressure you go at your own pace but if you do the whole workout i will tell you you will feel it my body is sore right now i can barely lift my arms so okay that physical pain i can understand um i when you had mentioned that like on our way to the recording that you're like okay you know i'm just finishing from working out i'm gonna put a shirt on and then i'll be on the zoom like do you notice a better, a more substantial energy when you recap these episodes after a workout as opposed to not after a workout? I can say yes, after a workout, because the first time I did it was last week and then this week. And it was like, OK, this is good. I feel good. I've got energy. I have mental clarity. I don't have like the stress of the day on my head. Nothing like that. And this is week four that I've been doing it for. So I'm to keep up with it it feels good i feel good and i like it cool cool um i think my equivalent would be um so my schedule currently is tuesday through friday i just uber eats and doordash for 12 maybe 12 plus hours so that's a lot of you know staying in your car going to a restaurant getting back in your car again it's just a lot of being in one place um, and then my day off during the week, Mondays, is working on this podcast through, you know, editing, social media, whatever. So that's a lot of sitting in one place as well. I get a little bit of exercise here and there by taking the dogs out. But it's very important that after a day of podcasting stuff to take a shower and meditate because I often am very... Um, I just feel disgusting and anxious and all frizzled from the busy day. So I like what you mean by like exercising just gives you that reset, like things like showering, meditating, you know, getting some outside exposure with dogs. Like we need those resets because if we don't get those resets, then we become 
very stressed out shrimp. We become <laughs> very bad shrimp. Ugh, rubbery. Exactly. We don't want that. Hey, our next episode, we're recapping. <laughs> two more, two more. I get it. And, and, and it's funny because we're acting like we're, re- oh, look, look, whoa. As we, as you said, two more, a bunch of balloons popped up in your Zoom video. That's awesome. Oh my God. Okay. I'm going to figure out all these Zoom gestures. Let me put my hands down before I do something else. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, it, it's worth a balloon celebrating. Um, I know we're acting like we're about to end the, the entire series, but no, we, we are just close to ending season one. We, we we started recording this in October <laughs> and here we are and we're just finishing this up. I mean, it's pretty much the equivalent of a full television season, a full school year that we've been doing this. So needless to say, you and I, we are so happy to get to that finish line closer. And this was a decent episode. I I, I didn't think too bad of this one. This is uh, episode 21, Bowl Me Over, original air date, April 20th, 1990. And I think Rich Corell is back in the directing saddle with this one. So our penultimate season Season one episode coming up. I cannot wait for that because it means that we are getting closer to the end where we could take a break. (laughs) We are getting close. We are getting close. I am excited for this episode because I personally enjoy bowling, but I am super excited to be done with the first season. Yeah. I am excited. I can't lie. Yep. Yep. Because it just represents a a vacation, just a, a time to rest and recharge. And it also represents the beginning of the new phase of this podcast where we can implement these new fresh ideas. I mean, I have warm memories of bowling with family back in the day with um, my now wife. That was one of our first date ideas. We, we did that. Uh-huh. So I think that there are a lot of warm memories associated with bowling that give me a positive bias toward this episode. So I cannot wait to see how you and I feel. I'm excited. It's going to be a blast. Yeah, yes. All right, wrap us up. Okay, so I'm going to try to use this term and I hope I use it correctly. So because this is the delicious recap, we're shipped and letting the deliciousness ring. Thank you.